Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where the writer's strike has been averted. It was down to the wire. Even at 2 a.m. last night, East Coast time, things hadn't been decided, which was just an hour to go until the current contract expired. But at the very, very last minute, they reached a deal, and everybody's happy because the TV writers are getting paid more, and TV can continue uninterrupted. Uh, I think that's the main reason they were able to, to strike a deal this time, and this is all going to happen in three years again, because they signed a three-year contract. Uh, so then they'll renegotiate again and threaten a strike. And I'm sure the Writers Guild feels emboldened because TV seems to be a really good stick to threaten the, the studios with, you know, the, the potential to shut that down. Especially because TV is now a year-round thing with streaming services, right? Like Netflix and Amazon, they have things all the time constantly. Uh, you know, it's not like it used to be with, uh, you know, seasons, right? So you could maybe like have your contract expire right at the beginning of summer and be like, we have a couple of months to work this out. Although the last writer's strike wreaked a lot of havoc on the movie business. But speaking of the movie business, it's interesting because a couple of film writers, late in the game as the discussions in the message boards, you know, in the comment sections on um, uh, articles about this uh, developed, right? Uh, a couple of film writers were emboldened and were like, you know, just to point it out, you're not really doing anything for us. This is all about TV writers. But film writers, unfortunately, are in a one-and-done situation. I mean, there are rewrites and polishes, and that's part of their complaint, that often certain rewrites are uh, categorized as less work than they actually are for the pay rate, right? And they're like, but I can't do anything about it because they'll just replace me with another... Because there are very few name screenwriters working today when you think about it. I really only say it's Aaron Sorkin and uh, Drew Goddard, quite frankly. Uh, I'm sure there are a couple other names you can think of, but no one that you are like, oh, we can't lose that person. And you're like, oh, just go get me... The Go call the major agencies and see who's available. Get me somebody new and let's see what they've got. Uh, it's tough business, uh, particularly for writers. You know, uh, if you're not a if you're not a writer director, because once you're done with the script, and sometimes you hear stories of uh, film writers being on set and helping with rewrites, but for the most part, you hand your work over and you pray to God it's somewhat close to that when it hits the screen, because you're going to be blamed for it. But anyway, TV is a, a consistent gig. You have to report to work on a regular basis, so you have more leverage. Uh, so uh, again, this is a three, so what did they sign? So this is a three-year contract, uh, and the Writers Guild has said that they got gains in the minimums. That means that's the minimum amount you can be paid as a writer uh, it's in certain situations. Uh, and also, they got contributions to the health plan. So basically, you have to hire um, you know, union writers, and to have that deal for your show, you have to you know, give some money, obviously, to their health plan. And that helps That helps give health insurance to some writers who aren't employed. And I think that's very nice. I think that's important, right? Because, again, it's a tough business. Uh, the be when you're actually a working writer in showbiz, TV is the best gig you can get. Because, you know, movies are not, not consistent. You can get a movie here and there. But, again, unless you're a really big-name talent or if you're a script doctor. Being a script doctor is very lucrative. Carrie Fisher, for instance, was a script doctor. Um, I forget his name off the top of my head. He's from Reno 911. I think his name is Tom Thomas Lennon. Uh, he, you know, he's also an actor, but he's written like Night at the Museum movies, but he's also a very well-known script doctor. So that's another, so TV writer and script doctor are the most lucrative writing gigs you can get because you're in demand and you get paid a lot of money. Uh, and, they, and again, the strike was about making sure that TV continued to be a good job. So the minimums were increased. The health plan is, is, is uh, reinforced. There's also an increase in t uh, pay TV residuals because, of course, pay TV is part of where it's at right now with... Uh, uh, and I guess I wonder if Netflix counts as pay TV because this is a subscription service. It probably does. Amazon and um, Netflix. So Amazon, Netflix, HBO, Showtime. Showtime's actually you know doing really well right now. Uh, it finally got on the board. Woohoo! I mean, it did to some degree with like sh shows like Homeland, but it, I think it's 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 the best it's at right now. By the way, I watched Billions last night. So good. I mean, talk about good writing. And you, ha and you have to watch the whole season at least. I mean, I would recommend that you catch up. I think it's only, it's only season two. Uh, and the, the talk about short seasons. They're not long at all. And that's another reason that they worry because it's not as strong a paying gig because, you know, it's a shorter season. So there's less episodes to write. But it's like, a, I think the best example I can think of writing right now, which just proves these people deserve every penny that they're they're asking for. They also got uh, job protection on parental leave, and also something about like uh, how much work 
how much time can be put into an episode before you go into technically overtime, right? Before you're, you know, you should be paid, you know, your episode fee is no longer, no longer covers your work. So I think this is great. And I think that, you know, unions, it's a double-edged sword. You know, as they famously say, a good compromise leaves everybody a little unhappy. <laughs> if anyone's really happy with the deal, the other side got a bad deal. So I think this turned out great. I'm glad there's not going to be a strike. Uh, and let's, we'll do this again in three years. And I feel bad for film writers Sounds like to some degree. It's like, yeah, it sucks for you guys. Uh, yeah, it's tough. Uh, all right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second story of the day is that the Tony nominations came out this morning. And they are going to take place very soon, June 11th. And they'll be hosted by Kevin Spacey. Now, that's the first interesting part of this story. Kevin Spacey, of course, that's timed beautifully to promote House of Cards Season 5, which begins May 30th. So I'm sure they're going to be like running ads for House of Cards during the Tonys and being like, are you enjoying Kevin Spacey's hosting? Well, you could see him on Netflix right now, the whole season. I really like House of Cards. But speaking of House of, Car House of Cards, it's interesting to me that Robin Wright has really become a, a powerhouse, not only within the show, her character, but behind the scenes. Uh, she just recently fought for equal pay and won. Good for her. But also she got, she's in Wonder Woman, although you wouldn't really know it from the advertising for the movie. And she's also in the upcoming new Blade Runner movie, 2049. We're getting a trailer uh, in two weeks with Alien Covenant. Actually, maybe next week because it opens uh, internationally. Ooh, very exciting. You got to pay attention to those international release dates. Uh, so anyway, what's Kevin Spacey doing? He's like, you're stealing my show from me, Robin, right? House of Cards is mine. It's me. I produce it. It's my stuff. So what he has coming up is he has, he's in Baby Driver. You know, he looks very good in that trailer. He's also in Ridley Scott's All the Money in the World with Mark Wahlberg and Michelle Williams. That's not really on anyone's radar quite yet, though. And then also Billionaire Boys Club, where he isn't the star. That's Taryn Edgerton and Ansel Elgort. And it also stars Emma Roberts and Carrie Fisher's daughter, Billy Lord. Uh, so that's not nearly as good as Robin Wright's uh, current positioning in Hollywood. So I think this is a big win for Kevin Spacey to remind people that House of Cards is his show. It's, I, I, to be honest with you, I think it's both shows you couldn't have it with, without either one of them so they should be paid equally but let's not make it let's not pretend that Robin Wright's more important than Kevin Spacey they're truly equals on that show which is very cool so as for the nominations themselves do we have a new Hamilton not really but the uh, the top uh, musical nominees are Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 which uh, stars Josh Groban who's also Tony nominated himself Hello Dolly which is uh, I think the, the biggest selling uh, ticket seller of all time on Broadway with Bette Midler returning to the stage at 71, and David Hyde Pierce, they're also both nominated. And then Dear Evan Hansen has been nominated, which is interesting because it's kind of like the musical version of 13 Reasons Why, which is burning up Netflix right now. So that's interesting to see two, um, you know, one a Netflix series and one a musical on Broadway that deal with teen suicide and the ramifications of it. Uh, and then in the play category, the top nominees of, you know, the most nominations are A Doll's House Part Two. that's obviously the very famous Ibsen play, you know, you should be familiar with that if you want to have a basic understanding of um, uh, literature. And then also Oslo, which is a play about the 1993 Israel and Palestine negotiations that were orchestrated by a Norwegian couple. That's like total awards bait. And it worked. All right, so that's the second story of the day. I'm curious, have you seen any of those shows? And, you know, uh, you know, the reason I'm covering it here is not only because of what's going on with Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright, uh, but also, you know, maybe you'll see something there make a, make a jump especially because musicals are doing, you know, after Beauty and the Beast and everything, maybe they might consider moving, you know, jumping Dear Evan Hansen to the big screen. Although if things like um, the Book of Mormon haven't jumped uh, and Hamilton still hasn't jumped to the big screen, you can see it's easier said than done. Then the third story of the day is that M. Night Shyamalan has confirmed that Glass is a Go, his third film in his now unbreakable trilogy. And it's been set, you know, he said before he was working on the outline, he's done. It's got the green light from Universal. He's going to stay with Universal and Jason Blum. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But he announced that uh, it'll be James McAvoy, uh, Bruce Willis, both returning from Split, and Samuel L. Jackson, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, I'm sure, is thrilled. I've never seen someone campaign so hard to get work. And it works for him. It literally pays off. Good for him. He was at Star Wars Celebration being like, I think Mace Windu's alive. <laughs> and also, I was surprised to see that Anna Taylor-Joy will be returning. Uh, and she's being called the prodigy. Will she become like a superhero or something? I don't know. Everybody talks about how great Anna Taylor-Joy is. And I think she has really wonderfully expressive eyes, really capture your attention. But she hasn't done anything yet, in my opinion. I didn't see The Witch, to be fair, which made me go, who's this person? She's amazing. I'm like, oh yeah, that's an actress that's really, you know, she's the it girl in Hollywood right now. I've yet to see that 
proven in an actual movie or in box office results. Because I don't think anybody wanted to see Split because of Anna Taylor jo- Anya, Anya Taylor Joy. Or left saying, who, that Anya Taylor Joy boy? I mean, that was James McAvoy's breakout hit. And you no, know, not the beginning of his career. So it just goes to show you, stay the course. You never know what can happen. But anyway, Glass is set for January 18th, 2019. That's ridiculous. That's so far away. It must be really much more, he must be much more expensive. You know, a sp- Split was very, very cheap to make, uh, funded personally by M. Night Shyamalan to keep, so he could keep creative control. Uh, so it must be a more expensive movie to take this. Uh, maybe also Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson are busy. I can't imagine what Bruce Willis is busy doing. And also maybe uh, James McAvoy has commitments for the X-Men movies, come to think of it. So you're co- it's coming out January 18th, 2019, globally, day and date. So M. Night Shyamalan, and he said this, he's promising secrets, right? So make sure you see it like Thursday or Friday night if you don't want it ruined for you. Uh, Interestingly, though, even though that's in 2019, that weekend's already crowded. It's got two family movies on it. Pigeon Impossible. That's right, Pigeon Impossible from Fox. And also the Playmobil movie, uh, trying to capitalize on Lego success, way after the, the fact from Open Road Films. And as we recently discussed, Open Road Films can't really open a film to save its life. Uh, So many of their films so unfairly go unnoticed. Uh, For instance, we were just talking about uh, Nightcrawler. Um, That it's a real, that I'm surprised Playmobil can't get a better distributor. Although it's not like the most, it's not the cool, I love Playmobil. I think, well, a lot of people actually like Playmobil, but I think it's not like the most well-known or coolest of toy brands. But anyway, uh, one of those will probably have to move, uh, but, but it's, it's, it will be the two family movies, uh, you know, fighting each other for the same box office dollars. Glass is good. Uh, but interestingly enough, again, he'll be staying with Jason Blum and Universal Studios, who handled Split. Uh, but the really interesting thing is that Unbreakable, the first of these films, was a Disney movie. And Disney and M. Night Shyamalan, if you don't know this, you know, Disney released all of his films early on, including The Sixth Sense, and he was like their golden boy, and they had a great relationship until M. Night Shyamalan, who's known for being not the nicest guy, uh, got into a fight with Nina Jacobson, who at that point was working at this, running the, the studio with uh, Dick Cook over Lady and Water on script notes. And M. Night Shyamalan was like, you Philistines, you don't understand great work. And he took his movie and he went to Warner Brothers. And it was his first flop. Their script notes were right. Uh, so it was actually the first flop of many, and it was the beginning of the serious downturn in his career. And I'm, I'm, see, I'm curious to see as he has a potential uptick now, if he's really learned his lessons or he will revert right back to his old bad habits. We'll see. I really liked the visit. I thought the visit was very, very good. I thought Split was... I thought James McAvoy's performance was amazing, but I thought that I had some problems with the film uh, overall. Uh, but still, uh, I'm definitely going to see this. This is very exciting. So, what do you think of Glass? Uh, and do you think that do you think that M Night? If you were a betting person, if I were Universal and Blum, I would not leave him unchecked, especially if I was going to give him more money. I mean, if he's paying for this himself, I guess he can do what he wants. But if they've upped the budget beyond like the 10 or 11 million, I'd be like, you got to show me the script. All right. So those are the three stories of the day. Now I have a really interesting viewer question here from Samuel Helligers. And Samuel Helliger says, Hi Grace, I've been a fan for a few years now. Ah, uh, thanks Sam. And enjoy hearing your take on movies and television. This is actually my first time commenting. That's two days in a row, first time commenters getting their questions answered. So, oh wow, we're on a roll. Uh, don't lie about being the first time you asked a question. I'm not going to use that. I'm not, I, I always just, it's nice, but I'm not going to use that as justification for picking questions going forward. But anyway, Samuel says, But I hope that you might answer this question on Morning Movie News in the near future. I am a Christian, and I, but I find most Christian-themed films extremely corny or simply not done correctly, such as in the case of Ridley Scott's recent missteps. I think he's talking about Exodus. It hurts me to see that most films with a Christian message, message tend to be of poor quality, you know, like the, 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 the church bait movies that come out recently, um, uh, and seem to be only made for other Christians. With movies like Hacksaw Ridge and Silence last year, both of which I thought were movies everyone should see, especially Hacksaw, why aren't more movies with Christian themes or similar themes being made with the same quality of those movies? Obviously, both are directed by quality filmmakers, uh, Mel Gibson and Martin Scorsese. So does it simply come down to needing people who are not necessarily Christian but are more popular to make films about faith in order to reach the mainstream audience? Thank you in advance if you were able to take the time to answer. Ah, great question, Samuel. Very unique. I really like it. First off, though, I want to point out that the two filmmakers in question are very religious. 
uh, Martin Scorsese. This has been a passion project of his for quite some time. Silence with the Catholic, you know, talking about Catholicism. And Mel Gibson, of course, is to some famously, to some infamously religious. And he also did The Passion of the Christ, which I think is an absolutely phenomenal film. And he's th thinking of doing a sequel to that which I think I'm very excited about. And I thought I would have to agree with you. Both films I thought were excellent commentaries on Christianity, particularly Hacksaw Ridge. And I thought Hacksaw Ridge was very accessible to anybody of any faith because it was really talking about faith in terms of a specific, in, 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 um, and not a specific religion, whereas Silence obviously was very much about Christianity. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you'll see that Hacksaw Ridge didn't actually win any awards even though it got plenty of nominations, and silence was ignored outright by everybody, including audiences. So the thing is, what's really hurting the situation, Samuel, is that it's not a great career move, unfortunately, to make a movie that focuses heavily on Christianity these days, because the mo audiences, for the most part, aren't aren't really that religious. I mean, you have to have like a really good angle, right? Um, Mel Gibson's very good at coming up with that, whereas Martin Scorsese was not. Uh, you know the you know the conscientious objector great 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 angle great entry point of the discussion and of course the passion of the christ was one of the best examples of turn the other cheek and christ taking everyone's sins upon himself for the benefit of all of mankind it was just so it was just beautifully illustrated you know those are phenomenons and i think that makes mel gibson a very unique filmmaker when it comes to christianity but for the most part Audiences aren't interested in a movie about Christianity, and the media in particular is not interested in a movie about Christianity. It's also a very difficult political climate right now, and I think that even though I'm sure Christian movies would not have a political affiliation, one could be accidentally assigned to it just as, a, as an assumption. So it's a, it's a very tricky place to go with potentially no reward. So if it's with, no, with very little chance of an upside and a very big chance of a downside, well, I think most filmmakers are like, you know what, I don't want to go there. And so the only people left to make those movies are filmmakers who aren't going to be in Hollywood because they don't have the quality of work you know that, that that could get them there and so they're able to make you know it's a it's a cottage industry making these religious films that you're referencing and they're done totally outside of the hollywood machine and they're done by people who have no interest in working in hollywood and probably couldn't work in hollywood but they are getting bigger name talent for instance the shack had uh, octavia spencer an oscar winner although she has a very hard time getting work and sam worthington so it's a difficult situation and i think we can only hope that there become more filmmakers like mel gibson um, and also, you know, Mel Gibson only started to do this once he became a huge star and he had some capital to spend. And we talk a lot about having capital to spend. So the idea is that hopefully at some point someone will feel that they should spend that capital on a, a religious film and not just Christianity. Uh, I thought the, the recent film Norman with Richard Gere talked a lot about um, uh, uh, the Jewish community in New York City, which I thought was really uh, impressive, and you know that community. You know, certainly not so much from a religious perspective. Again, more from a community perspective. But I thought it did have a lot to do with faith and, and how those were intertwined. So it's there, uh, and that's a very high quality film as well. So if you're interested in just stories about religion in general, Samuel, I would suggest you check that out. Uh, so that's that's the issue. It's just tricky. Um, and you need someone also like Mel Gibson who isn't, who's, who's very bold, which is also unusual, uh, although you can see that boldness has gotten him into trouble as well. So, uh, but he's such a talented filmmaker that he's managed to rise above it. So we'll see. If he makes that Passion of the Christ sequel, I think you and everybody will be very happy, Samuel, because he is a very gifted filmmaker. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please write down below today's top three stories and also Samuel's viewer question. What do you think of religious films? How do you feel about religious films, particularly ones about Christianity? Do you go to them? Are you, are you, do you intentionally avoid them? Uh, and why do you think that more people don't make Christian films? And did you see Hacksaw Ridge or Silence? I actually highly recommend both of those movies. But if you have to pick, I agree with Samuel, Hacksaw Ridge is the film to see. It's phenomenal. It's not only great, it's not only about Christianity, and as I said, more so faith, but it's also about personal sacrifice and heroicism and being a soldier um, and what it's like to be drafted and, and to honor that commitment to your country when they call upon you. Really stellar. Really good stuff. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in, and you can check out some more videos right now.